is there a difference between humans and animals? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let me read to, some, read to you some statistics that I came across recently, and I'll, I'll go ahead and pre-apologize uh, because some of y'all are going to downright hate me after this introduction, so just hold on. Cat and dog owners spend about $300 a year on pet food and treats. It's not horrible, $300. It's not too bad. Dog owners spend $73 a year on grooming. Still not horrible. Over 50% of cat and dog owners give their pet a Christmas gift or treat. Uh, starting to turn a little bit here. Market Watch reported back in 2018 that the Halloween pet costume industry in the U.S. reached $480 million dollars that year. I can't say dollars, dollars. It was almost double what it was in 2010. That seems crazy, but when you take into the account that the modern-day American market for pets is $99 billion in 2020, it kind of all fits together. So I guess I should ask again, is there a difference between humans and animals? And I think really what we would have to say is, yeah, there is. Dogs have never spent a dime on us, right? (laughs) That is about the only difference. Now, I mean, that's tongue-in-cheek, but When we kept a pet, we did some of the very same things that most everyone else does. So I can't throw stones. These animals that God has given us, they are blessings, usually. (laughs) Usually. They offer companionship, aid. They serve a purpose. And they usually remind us of the amazing creator that we have. Solomon wasn't kidding when he wrote in Proverbs that a righteous man regards the life of his beast or his animal. How you treat the least of these, including the creatures that God has created, shows a lot of how you see the Creator. These are those to whom God gave us dominion. And we, being image bearers of God, we ought not be cruel taskmasters, killing, torturing at will any animal that we want. It ought to be done sustainably and with responsibility. However, We also need to walk the balance beam of not paying too much homage to mere animals. Romans 1 actually deals with this, and it's almost like reading the newspaper, Romans 1 is. Verse 22, Paul says of these that they, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. The fact of the matter is, is that there are a great many people in the United States who all out worship their animals. The reason that we need to ask the question, are humans different from animals, is because of the teachings of origins through natural process that are are in most classrooms today. If someone doesn't hold to a divine creation narrative like what we have in the Genesis account, then the only thing left for them to say, finally, is that there is no difference between man and animals. And many, in a lot of classrooms, are hearing it, whether through subterfuge or plain out, the mere phrase, humans are animals. And there is not any truth in that. It's a pretty basic assumption that's taught in a whole lot of classrooms today. Now, aside from my obvious issue with that, i.e. the Bible, (laughs) if someone believes that humans are animals, then the only natural conclusion of our diet, what we eat, must be that we should be vegans or cannibals. I am not interested in becoming either of those two. If we are animals, then we ought not eat other animals, other sentient beings, as one organization in the United States would claim, or we would have to claim that we are ourselves cannibals eating other animals. Um, You know, I I try to not use foul language from the pulpit, so I apologize for saying the word vegan 
tonight. It's really, really bad. We can't just say that humans are different and that we are sentient or that we use tools or that we bond in relationships or that we communicate because the truth of the matter is that there are plenty of other creatures in God's world who do the exact same things. What makes us different from the animals? Scripture teaches that human beings are different from other creatures other creatures, and how God took time in creating man and woman. Adam was formed of the dust of the ground. Eve was crafted from the rib of Adam. This seems to be different from any other creature that God created. These creatures, they, they just seem to come forth at His bidding. He speaks them into existence and they spring forth. But also, Scripture says that man was created in the image of God. The Lord doesn't say that about any other creature in all the Word of God. Human beings are also different in creation as God not only commanded them to be created, but then He also spoke to them. Think of that. Very early on, you can see that God desired to have a relationship with these Men and women, in that He spoke to them. He didn't just speak at them. He didn't just command them to exist. He had a conversation with Adam and Eve. He desired to have a relationship with them. You don't find God doing that with other creatures in the Genesis account. God gave humanity freedom of the will. By putting the the cursed tree in the garden. God gave Adam and Eve a choice to continue to obey and live in relationship with Him or to rebel against Him for a mere piece of fruit. It doesn't do that for any other creature. They're not given that opportunity of to accept, deny, obey, disobey, rebel, or stay in communion with God. It's only to human beings. I believe that the Genesis account, at very least, Hence, at another difference between humanity and animals, and that is man having a soul. Genesis 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. That might not be a completely unique unique statement right there about the breath of life and becoming a living being. That is said of other creatures, but it's pretty close because of the distinct amount of time that he puts into creating humanity. If you need further evidence, though, that man was created with a soul, you need to only turn to the old preacher's words in the book of Ecclesiastes. When Solomon proclaimed in Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time, and he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. Nothing at all is said of the destiny of animals, but this Ecclesiastes passage, this eternity, this idea of existing even after death, this is unique to humankind. This doesn't come to any other creature. So establishing that basis that humans are in fact different from animals and establishing that fact through the Word of God is incredibly important. You might think that that sounds elementary, but I'm telling you, it's not. It may be basic, but it doesn't mean that it's childish. The main reason for our discussion tonight that I bring the difference of man and the animals or humankind and the animals, the difference that they have, is our discussion tonight on the idea of conscience and how God gave or gifted mankind conscience. Here's something I want us to think through. An animal can be trained, but it will never have a conscience. It will never have the ability to discern between right or wrong. I know we say bad dog. Do we say bad cat? I don't even know what we do with cats. (laughs) Is there such thing as a good cat? No, anyway, all right, sorry. Again, you're going to hate me after this sermon, I'm telling you. No. I know we say bad dog, but the truth of the matter is he's being... A dog. (laughs) He can't 
discern between right and wrong. There's training involved, obviously, but he hasn't been gifted. And I know you have a special pet. He hasn't been gifted in that way. The idea of discernment of conscience, it's not within him. You know, conscience is what caused Adam and Eve, in my imagination, with the juice still running down their chins, it made them realize that they were naked, and it made them run away ashamed. When God bans them from paradise, what does He do? He references their newly found conscience. Genesis chapter 3, verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. That's conscience. For us today, living under the curse for millennia, conscience is a good thing, isn't it? I hope, I hope you agree conscience is a good thing. Conscience is what warns us that we are stepping outside of God's prescribed parameters, His best way to live parameters. It warns us. But for Adam and Eve, conscience, it was a result of their sin. It's the idea of they jumped the fence, and having jumped it, immediately realized that the fence was there to protect them, and now there is no way of getting back over that fence. Banished from paradise. Yes, they have conscience now. They're able to discern between good and evil, but it's nowhere near what they had experienced in the garden of paradise with God. You know, some movie script writers, they would say that conscience is far better than the alternative of living in a grayscale paradise. But their secular and wrong assumption is that the opposite of conscience is ignorance thinking that Adam and Eve just lived in ignorance, and as soon as they tasted of the fruit, their minds exploded with color, and all this whole new world was given to them. That's not it at all. The opposite of conscience is not ignorance. For Adam and Eve, the opposite of conscience was obedience. And they denied obedience, and they would choose rather to have the ability to choose right and wrong than to simply obey what God says is right. And wrong. And in this, the serpent wasn't really lying when he said, you will become like God. They wanted the responsibility of seeing good and evil for themselves and not leaving it up to God. So they forfeit obedience. They forfeit a relationship with God for a mere conscience. You know, very quickly into humanity's story, we see the far-reaching effects of living out of conscience. Because again, while we see it as a positive thing which keeps us, or hopefully keeps us within the parameters of God's prescribed will, we also kick against our conscience daily, don't we? And you don't have to look very far at all after the fall of man. All you have to do is just turn the page and Cain murders Abel. See, the issue with conscience is that conscience can be seared. Paul speaks intently about this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. He's speaking of the day in which many will fall away. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, 
forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Paul mentions this idea of one's conscience being seared. For those of us who have scar tissue of any kind of or any kind of you know degree on your body, you probably understand what Paul is talking about there. I've got a little scar tissue on my arm, and you just don't feel exactly right. I can feel when somebody touches it, but it's not like touching elsewhere. That area was so traumatized by a burn or by a wound or by a broken bone, it was cut so deep that it actually severed nerves to total disrepair. There's a disease. I'm by no means a, anybody in the medicine field at all. There's a, there's a disease that goes by the abbreviation of CIPA or C-I-P-A uh, because there's no way I'm going to actually pronounce what it actually stands for. When I was in middle school, I remember reading about someone who was diagnosed with SEPA. At first, I thought it was a pretty cool thing. I thought it sounded like a superpower. The whole idea of SEPA is that you cannot feel pain. And to a middle schooler who is constantly feeling pain because of dumb things that I was doing, it sounded like a great idea. The problem came when the character that I was reading grabbed a hot utensil off the stove and continued to use it, all the while unaware that it was literally melting his hand. All the while couldn't feel it because of SEPA, because of this disease. And in that regard, your conscience is your spiritual nervous system. Through it, you can detect sin that's sprouting or festering. Without it, what happens? Addictions, habitual sins, Paul tells Timothy, leading others astray, eventually and ultimately spiritual death, as was the character in the story with Sipa, all because he couldn't feel when he was being burned. Now, thankfully, our God is one who makes dead, dull, and seared things come alive. I'm going to be reading a lot of Scripture tonight. I hope that doesn't bore you. I understand how just listening to the Word of God can sometimes be a little hard to just stay in tune with, but I want you to listen to what Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2 when he says, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. Verse 1, and you he made alive. Your story has been drastically changed, once dead, once seared, once dulled to Christ, now made alive. To the Corinthians, he writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, only Christ can make what was dead, what was dull, what was seared, only Christ can make it alive. Only Jesus can take what was seared and make it tender. I'm rereading a book that I read when I was in high school. It's from 1962 by the Teen Challenge founder, David Wilkerson. Wilkerson details in his book, how in 1958, as a pastor of a rural church in small-town America, he one morning 
grabbed the copy of Life magazine off of his mantle and began flipping through it. And he came across this story of senseless violence. Seven boys, boys, not adults, boys. Seven boys in a gang in New York randomly attacked and murdered a handicapped child. At random. In 1958. The golden days. Wilkerson was overcome with a desire to reach out to those seared and hardened kids. Long story short, Wilkerson left nearly everything he had. He traveled to New York City where he dedicated his life to taking Christ to gang members of the Puerto Rican Mau Mau's, a gang in Brooklyn. And after months and months of faithful preaching, constant testifying, and continual acts of love to these forgotten kids, on a final night before he was going to have to head back home after a series of evangelistic services, two boys, Nikki Cruz and Israel Navarez, both now evangelists, literally traded in their weapons for Bibles. You can see them handing them over to Wilkerson, receiving a Bible. They prayed and they received Christ. Only God can do something like that. Only Christ can make alive what was once dead. By the way, most of you are familiar with the story of Teen, of teen Challenge. It is now reaching thousands of kids and adults daily through their global outreach. In fact, some of our very own students and family members here at New Hope Church have been helped in some extraordinary ways by that organization. And you can testify, not necessarily of that ministry, but that God can soften. God can take dead nerves and make them tender again. But he doesn't force us. We get back to that old thing that he gave us, a gift, but also a curse, a catch-22 of sorts, a free will. Had he not given us that free will to accept or reject him, he would have created cheap automatons without any real capacity to love. All we would be doing would be following code, obeying his every word. And that's not what he wanted. He wanted a relationship with us. This idea of the free will of man, by the way, that is the human condition. That is where we find ourselves. And to see how far seared consciences will go, you really only have to look to the story of the great flood. By the way, I completely understand. On the days in which I listen to the news for more than 20 minutes, and I'm, I'm not joking, when I read one too many articles about current events, I feel it. This is a broken world. It is hurting and it is pained. But you think things are bad now? You think it's rough now? They are. But Jesus said once that they have been a lot worse. And also, in the same breath, said that they will get a lot worse again. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, he is preaching and he says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now we read the preface of the flood earlier, but I want us to read from Genesis 6 again. And if you mark in your Bible, I want you to underline the words that I emphasized from verse 5. Genesis chapter 6. Verse 5. Then the Lord saw 
that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Literally, the picture here is of men and women who would spend about 16 hours a day sinning constantly, and then the final eight hours of the rest of the day, it would be left for devising and dreaming of new sin that they might get in tomorrow. It's almost as if they had a 24-7 capacity of viewing anything they wanted online in the flood or before the flood. Wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. We see and hear snapshots of hope in this world, yet there were none in the pre-flood world. That's how bad things were. How in the world had it gotten that bad? How could a piece of stolen fruit lead to brother murdering brother? How could rebellion in eating fruit lead to rape and tyranny and abuse and molestation and abandonment and more? How could something seemingly so small, like eating vegetation, produce something like that? I do not know who originally coined it. I'd give credit if I knew. But I was once taught that what is tolerated in one generation becomes accepted in the next and becomes celebrated in the next. That is how the situation devolved so quickly. From fruit to murder to rape to tyranny. It's a seared conscience. I know with a topical sermon like this, I'm seeming to jump from one passage of Scripture to the next, but I think ironically, Solomon's proverb in the Song of Solomon teaches us a lot. I know it's dangerous to quote from the Song of Songs, but chapter 2, verse 15, finds Solomon and the one he loves having this exchange back and forth, and she says, catch us, or the she says to her brothers, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The little foxes that spoil the vines. I know nothing about wall building, and I even know less about husbandry, not being a husband, husbandry. What it seems to me, though, is that Solomon is saying that it's rarely the lion that comes crashing into the vineyard to eat everything. The walls are built to stop that kind of big danger. It's the smaller, unattended, no big deal holes in our wall or in our life that allow sin to ease its way in and ravage the bounty within. It's the small foxes that come in and destroy everything. The small holes in your life. The truth of the matter is, is that even though you're here on a Sunday evening and I'm thankful for you, and it shows a level of dedication that you would be here on an evening service, but the truth is, is that there are some, even in this congregation here tonight, who are playing with fire. that bitterness that you think you can just bring out whenever you want so that you can feel better about yourself, it will eat you alive. That habit that you see as basically harmless, it can consume all that is good in your life. You know, if Eve had only known 
that that piece of fruit would have led to the murder of one of her boys and the banishment of the other, she would have never gone anywhere near the center of the garden. But she did. Look at the product. 183 lives have been taken by violence since you've been in church tonight. That adds up to 4,384 who are killed every day by an act of violence. 2,055 divorces occur every day in America. 2,055 every day. 21 million Americans admit to having at least one serious addiction, but only 10% are seeking treatment or are trying to contain it. Those numbers, they're just a drop in the bucket. I mean, how many more issues or how many more stats could we give on just as serious, if not more serious, issues? God gave us a conscience and we have dulled it, drunk it, diluted it, and seared it. We creatures of dust committing high treason against the Lord of all creation. And yet, the most marvelous phrase in all of the verses in which we've read tonight come in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, where after the writer of the book spends time in showing how bad things are, he says in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That phrase, finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, or some iteration of that, it's only said of a few people throughout the Bible. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Mary. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty major big hitter lineup of these who have obtained favor or found grace in God's eyes. you got the ark builder, the nation starter, the deliverer, the monarch, and the mother chosen to carry the life of the Savior. To carry the Savior, excuse me. How in the world can we be the Noah and find grace in a perverse generation? You might think it's for the elite, that it's only those five that are mentioned throughout the Bible, but in reality, it's the same phrase that Paul affirms in one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That same grace that Noah found, and which we'll be looking at a bit more in depth next week, that same grace has been freely offered to you. So not to be cheesy and to go back to the first question, Are human beings different from animals? Absolutely. We're created in the image of God with eternity in our hearts, offered free grace and free salvation by the blood of Christ. He's given you a conscience. Don't sear it. One of my favorite stories in history is that of Martin Luther. I told you this morning that he's a rough character. And I'm not imagining that if you've read anything after him, again, different guy. God used him in a major way, but he wrote some pretty offensive stuff. But there was one moment where he was standing at the Edict of Worms, where he is being tried for the books that he had written. And he's being told by the leaders of the Catholic Church that he must deny what he has written. He must deny what he has preached. And Luther long and drawn out, but eventually came to one phrase where he said, 
My conscience is held captive to the Word of God. If you are seeking outside influences to inform your conscience, it will lead you astray every single time. But if you bind your conscience, your ability to view right and wrong, which was the result of the curse, but also a blessing from God now living under the curse, if you will bind your conscience to the Word of God, I promise you, you will be tested and afflicted, but you will never be let down. My conscience is held captive to the Word of God. It's possible this week that some of you need to pray what we sang already. Search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. It's possible that you have a seared conscience and you don't even know it. That's the very nature of a seared conscience. Practically speaking, I believe that that's one of the reasons why the Lord gave us the gift of fasting. So that for a particular time, over a particular topic, we can step away from the regular norm of our life. We can experience the hunger, the brokenness of this world. And it's in that moment Like David, we say, create in me a clean heart, a tender heart, O God. Restore me, renew me.